Thank you very, very much. My name is Karen Tucker, and I'm the Churchill Club's CEO. Welcome, and thank you very much for being with us tonight. In case you don't yet know us, Churchill Club regularly convenes conversations and gatherings since 1985, actually, to surface up-to-the-minute insights and opportunities for technology-related innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. So in tonight's session, we're going to hear about the emerging discipline of category design and how category leaders create, develop, and monetize new market categories. And our speakers are, not in the order they're coming up on the stage, uh, Chris Lockhead, Kevin Maney, Dave Peterson, and Al Ramadan, and they are the authors of a brand new book just out on the 14th of June that is well on its way to becoming an enduring bestseller. The name of that book is Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. And here to lead them in conversation is Tina Selig, professor of the practice in the Department of Management Science and Engineering at the Stanford School of Engineering. We want to thank the entire Play Bigger team for their partnership in creating this program. It has been stimulating, thought-provoking, and also a lot of fun to work with them. And we also want to thank Ann Miurico and Mike Maples from Floodgate, Tim Galeri and Jim Dorman of Sierra Ventures, and Chris Stedman of Silicon Valley Bank for their support that helped make this occasion possible. So if you're tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club and you'll find other Twitter handles in your bulletins. And now please give your warmest welcome to the Play Bigger team and Tina Seelig. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a great group we have here. It is so fun to do a session after everyone has had a glass of wine. <laughs> so it loosens everyone up, including these guys. So there are four of you who wrote this book. I mean, I can imagine four people who are in a band, but how do you write a book with four people? Who are you guys and how did you meet? Maybe you can tell that story. <laughs> I, oh, I got to start. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, a, a brief version. This guy over here, Al, uh, started a company called Quokka Sports way back in the 1990s. <laughs> talk about talk about designing a category. I mean, this is what Quokka did. They 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 defined something that brand new, and and I found it fascinating when I was a columnist at USA Today. Started a relationship with him, uh, writing about what they were doing there. Over the years, continued to talk to him, um, mostly often about technology and sports as those kinds of topics came up. Um, in the meantime, he struck up a relationship with these two guys, formed a firm called Play Bigger, um, had a thing going on for a while. Um, and a couple of years ago, when was it? Two years ago? It was like two and a half More years ago? Years. Something More like that. I get this mysterious sort of call from Al saying, um, you know, we're, we had some ideas about a crazy ideas about a book. Why don't you come have dinner with us? And uh, so I, I met these guys for dinner. We talked about it. Um, we just started knocking around ideas and said, ah, let's try it. And it led to um, what I have to say is the best working relationship I've ever had in my life. The four of us ended up uh, um, truly collaborating. I mean, like we, we start the, the very first very first words of the book are. Um, you know, most of the time you pick up a book, it's by a solo artist, and this book is by a band, and it was a very different kind of um, uh, experience, it's a very different kind of book, because it really is, it's like you two sitting down in a room and writing a song together. And, uh, uh, and, we, um, and, the, and the thing that's, when you, when you all read this book, the thing that I think I'm, I'm most maybe proud of is the fact that, um, that the relationship and the fun that we had comes out in the book. The book is, uh, is is a very different kind of business book to read, and uh, and you know any of you know, who know this guy will recognize some of the words in the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do a little bit of a uh, contest here. What word are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yes, star. <laughs> there are no stars in this no book. Stars, no. <laughs> no, straight up. Okay, so do you guys want to chime in? Do anyone else want to? We're all just. 
move on. Do you want to talk about how you met and uh, who you I'll, are? A little behind the scenes, though. Yeah. If you imagine for two years, where most of the book was written down in a place we call Casa Cruz in Santa Cruz. I think I'm the second to get up. If anybody knows Chris, he gets up about 4.30 in the morning. He oh, drinks gosh. two pots of coffee, scalding hot, and when you walk down the stairs, he's there, right there in your face, and <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> Eventually, Kevin gets up, he sets out the book, and puts a perfect plan together what we're going to talk about, then Al finally shows up. <laughs> Yeah, Al, Al's really, really old. Yeah, so we let we let Al get his sleep, and then we start talking. And then Kevin finally figures out that we don't talk about anything that he wants to talk about. We talk about what we want to talk about. And then we go out, ride bikes, think a little more, come back. He starts writing it down, all the things we talk about. Okay, so this all sounds like a lot of fun, but I think the book actually has a really important message. It's about the concept of category design. How many people have heard of the concept of category design before? Okay, how many people have never heard of the idea of category design? Okay, some of those brave people. What the heck is category design? Who's going to answer? <laughs> Alan, Alan, <laughs> I'm going to answer. <laughs> the old guy's got to answer. We think um, it is a new discipline in business. Um, and actually, I'm going to start with a little bit of a story to get it set. Uh, there are a number of people in this room who are from the foundation of a, a, a previous discipline called experience design. Those people in the room, put your hands up. So there's a bunch of them here, and this happened back in the early 2000s. It was essentially the bringing together of a number of different disciplines around this notion that you had to build a great experience in the digital world, and ultimately, of course, now we all know that to be true. There's 35,000 experience designers on LinkedIn today. That's in a decade and a half. And so as, as we... Chris, Dave, and I started to think about our careers and all of the work that we've done, both as operating execs as well as uh, as advisors. We started to see patterns and realized that, oh my gosh, there's a lot of things that did you we, do in marketing. Did we, did we register with them with the patent office? Or <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, there's there's a notion of that not only you have to do stuff in marketing, not only do you have to do stuff in sales, but you have to do stuff in product. And we came up with this notion called the magic triangle. It's in the book. It's the idea that you have the great companies bring together product design, which is a discipline. In fact, uh, Tim, I think, is one of the founders of product design. He's standing right here. Um, excuse me, Dennis. I lost my brain. Uh, in addition to product design, you have Tim's to have over there. company design. And the third piece of the magic triangle, which is the piece that was undocumented and only implicit in, in, in many of the great entrepreneurs, was this discipline called category design. And it's the idea of creating and dominating new markets. That's what category design is about. And we have laid out in the book essentially a 11-step process for creating uh, and dominating markets. So why is this important? Why should we care? Why should all these people care? Well, I, I can tell you this. The, the other piece of the book that we're so proud of is the research we did, and there's some kids over this side of the room, Stanford and otherwise, who actually did a lot of the data science. Lucas and Will, thank you so much. And if you look at, if you look at every single technology company that was founded since 2000, every single technology company founded since 2000, US-based, venture-backed, you see that there's 4,000-odd companies who completed the Series A, 75 ultimately went public as of the end of last quarter, and of those 35 companies, we identified as category kings. And those 35 companies commanded 76% of the market cap of the entire thing, the entire technology space. And so we found that time and time and time again that the leader of a category, think social networks or think Google AdWords or think any of these other categories that have been dominated by one company, that ultimately one company ends up taking 76% of the market cap. And so it's kind of a winner-take-all game. And so unless you embrace category design and understand what it is and how it plays out in this magic triangle, you run the risk of being a number two or number three or number four, which is not a material outcome these days. Once we, um, once we started to understand um, what category design looked like today, uh, one of the things we realized was that category design isn't new. Um, and in fact, if you pick up the book, the very first example you even encounter in the book is the story of Clarence Birdseye. Um, Birdseye is in the frozen foods. And you know, before Clarence Birdseye in the 1920s, there was no such thing as frozen food. Nobody had any idea what this was. You know, you bought food in a can, basically. Um, and this was a guy, he, was, you know, he, he uh, worked for the U.S. National Wildlife Refuge or whatever. He, he was working up in upper 
you know, Canada, North Pole kind of area. And he noticed that. How's it going, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that place up there where, you know. Uh, at, Easy. Yeah. Sitting right next <laughs> and, to you. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he, you know, I mean, he, he realized that he, he was watching these, these na- uh, you know, natives from the area. They would, they would fish and they would throw the fish on the ice and the fish would f- flash freeze. And he was like, got this idea of like, oh, you could actually flash freeze food and actually, you know, it would taste good afterwards. Anyway, the, uh, he ends up going back with this idea of frozen food, but there's no category, there's no infrastructure, there's no uh, uh, freezer case at a grocery store, there's no freezer cars for, for uh, trains to carry anything. And he, so he designs this whole thing and he sells everybody on this idea and he basically changes people's minds he under, to understand that frozen food is something different and interesting and a, and a brand new market. Uh, and, and time after time in history, there are great categories that were designed what we're saying is that that's not new, but what is new is, are the dynamics that make it so vitally important today. And it goes back to what I was saying about this winner take all and the data sets that we ran. Uh, and so now, you know, instead of just this one off, once in a while kind of thing, it's basically an ingredient of success. Um, and, you know, or as we say over and over in the book, a way to increase your odds of success is to actually adopt this category. So the, the bird's eye story is really compelling and it's a great entry to this concept, but that's also really complicated, right? They had to create all the infrastructure to make this work. Can you give some examples of category designs that sort of might be a little bit lighter weight where you can, where you don't have to actually create an entire infrastructure? Yeah, I think um, um, one of my favorite examples, and I didn't think about it because I was a customer um, around, the, and, and Kevin's actually one that dug up this example around uh, five hour energy. Right, and the insight, and this is where we go back, and we learned a lot from our friend Anne around, you know, how do these categories emerge and how do they originate from? And it's a technology or market insight. And the founder of Five Hour Energy had this big aha. So just because I'm tired, why do I have? It doesn't mean I'm thirsty. Why do I have to drink a big giant can of yuck, as you said in the book? And from that. He then went to work and created a very potent, I had one of those right before I took the stage, a five-hour energy. <laughs> and it's a different category. It's an energy shot, and it doesn't sit next to Red Bull, and it doesn't sit next to the Coca-Cola and the soft drinks and the, and the coffee. It sits in its own category, usually on the point-of-sale system. Actually, I think one of the most yeah. compelling examples you right. gave uh, when we were talking about this was right. when you go to the grocery store and you look down the aisles, there are labels. Each one of those is a category, and it was a huge aha that, oh my gosh, condiments, that's a category. Someone had to design that category. So when a client comes to you and says, I've got this product I'm about to launch, what's the process you go through with them to help them either understand or define a category? So Tina, just before we go there, the way we think about category design is it's kind of like a secret black art. So if you look at innovation in our world, as we all know, less than 2% of startups are ever worth anything that matters. And roughly 40% or 50% of the Fortune 500 turns over every 20 years. So half the Fortune 500 gets replaced. And so the adoption rate of innovation in our world is actually not very high. So when you realize that, you say, okay, well, what's the difference that makes the difference? Or said in a different way, what is it the legendary entrepreneurs do that's different from all of us who fail? And the aha around category design is, to Al's point, around the triangle. Most entrepreneurs or innovators do two things. They build what they think is a legendary product predicated on an insight. I'd like to have frozen food. Uh, And then they build a company to deliver that product. And then what they do is they go, ta-da! See? Here's the new carbon ingulator. (laughs) And they hope the world gets it. And sometimes the world does, Twitter. And most of the time the world doesn't, Segway. (laughs) And so we said, okay, well, what is it that the legendary entrepreneurs do that's different? And it turns out they don't do two things. They do three things. They design product, company, and category. And category design is materially different than marketing. What most people think of when they think of marketing is brand. I'm going to scream the name of my company really loud and hope you buy my shit. (laughs) Well, brands need a context. Products need a context. 
And that's what a category is. And what legendary category designers do is they teach the world to see things the way they did. Why Clarence was successful, Bird's Eye to this day is the number one seller of frozen food in America. And the reason that's true is because Clarence educated us about a problem that we didn't know we had. See, the problem didn't exist until he said, hey, it's a problem that you can't get fresh vegetables in February, right? And we went, right. <laughs> and then the minute we acknowledge the problem, we want the solution. And so what legendary category designers do is they teach the world to accept their vision, their perspective, and in specific, their point of view around a problem. And if people get the problem, they suck the solution out of the company. And that's what Steve Jobs did. That's what Mark Zuckerberg did. That's what Steve, uh, uh, um, uh, Gates did in the beginning. That's absolutely what Ellison did, et cetera, et cetera. And most of the rest of the world puts their innovation out and hopes you and I figure out why it matters. So how big does a category have to be? I mean, let's go back to the supermarket aisles. Is it a condiment or is it ketchup? <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, let's, let's uh, I mean, it, most, how big does it have to most be? Most start out as zero billion dollar markets, honestly. That's really how it starts. And um, to, to, to Dave's point about the, the, the founder, a little bit of what Chris was saying too, we've, we've been involved with 20 different companies here in the last five years, and there's a pattern that emerges, which is the founders generally have this insight. There's a missing in the world. In your example, it would be a condiment. It would be a source or something like that. That's the consumer example. And what they do is they're relentless about solving that problem. And the thing that we have found works, to Chris's point, is evangelizing the problem is what the great category designers do. When Jobs stood up to announce the uh, iPad, was anyone in the room when Jobs stood up? Actually, just as a matter of interest, anyone here? <laughs> well, he, he, on one side he had the laptop open, and the other side he had a phone. He said, look, there's a problem. We're missing a more intimate device. We're missing a, an experience where we're on a couch watching something, and we want to interact with content or our social network or whatever it might be. And we all fell into that problem space, understood exactly what he was talking about. And then he rolled out and said, and by the way, the solution is what? The iPad, right? And what did we do? We went and bought one. I bought one the first day. Right. And so did I, I think. <laughs> and so the point being is, is that it always starts out as a zero billion yeah. dollar market. And once you go through this triangle, you ultimately, you, you actually, if you can create the market and get the problem fixed in people's mind, people assume you know how to solve it. And if it's not a zero billion dollar market, it's a category that exists. Well, that's the question. Right. Can you choose to dominate an existing market? I mean, existing category. Not unless you Can I say, it. okay, there's the ketchup out there. I'm going to be the best ketchup in the world, or do you have to invent something totally new? Well, there's the energy drink right. example Dave just okay. gave. is a perfect example. The energy shot is not an energy drink. It solves a very similar problem, but it's not the yeah. same thing, and it's not thought of the same way. You grab a handful of them as you go out at the cash register, you don't go up with your, your cart and pull a whole bunch of stuff off the shelf, right? They have different mental space, even though it's solving the same problem. And, and I think it gets into, uh, we did a lot of work into actual, the brain science. It goes on in this really noisy world that we live in. Um, you know, if you look at all the market factors and the environmental factors that are happening today, um, the good news about the marketing engines in the world is they work and they make a lot of noise. The bad news is they work and they make a lot of noise. And there's probably an unprecedented amount of digitization of marketing and, and volume in the space. And then you combine that with the, uh, Mike, the article you just wrote around the fact that any startup now can either go from you know raising $5 million to start their business down to $500,000, probably even kickstart it if you wanted to. It's two and million so, apps on the Apple iStore. Exactly. So you can have more startups with a lower cost of making more noise. So, and so uh, I guess the whole point is, if you don't create the container <laughs> for the customer to know where you live in this giant, high fidelity or low fidelity, high uh, volume world, there's no way they can make that decision. And, and Tina, here's the distinction: every entrepreneur we've ever talked to that any of us have ever met thinks their product's better, and they will tell you about it forever. <laughs> Right? <laughs> the world doesn't accept better in an existing market. And the proof of this is Pepsi's been trying to do this for fucking a hundred years. <laughs> and they still can't do it. 
And so the distinction between better and different is what really matters. The world can accept different. Different is what begins to create a new category around either A, a problem that we didn't know that we had, frozen food, or B, a problem that we knew we had but we hadn't thought about in that way, Netflix. So when Netflix starts, Reed Hastings doesn't go, hey, we're better than Blockbuster. No. They say, going to get a movie at the video store sucks. <laughs> right? You show up, there's a sweaty kid with zits behind the thing, and you pay the late fee, and they don't have the movie you want anyway, and so you got to get another movie, and then you got to talk to your wife, and if you have kids, and the whole thing, and nobody can agree, and we agreed on the way in, but now we got to look at another one. Huh? huh? Right? And Reed says there's got to be a different way. And he, he drives the market based on that insight to think about the problem called how do I get a video in my house that I actually want to watch in a very different way. And he, and I'll use this word on purpose, conditions the market to think about it the way he does. And when we agree with Reed, we go, hey, we're not going to Blockbuster paying the late fees and seeing the sweaty kid. We're going to the website. And the whole market shifts around a set of, we call them Frodo's or From Two's. And he doesn't compete with Blockbuster. He makes their market go away. The market was here and now it's here. That's category design. So let me ask you though, we have a room full of entrepreneurs and that was very compelling. Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> okay, great, great. Should everyone in this room design a new category? I mean, is that just all of our jobs? Should we have an infinite number of categories? Well, the, the answer, the short answer is yes, or redefine one that exists to Chris's point. And um, the reason that we're confident that this happens and can happen, Anne Murico was uh, kind enough to have us at Stanford to teach 50 of the students uh, in the master's class about category design as part of their overall process. Who, are there any Stanford kids in the students? In the, in the, here they are. Well, these are the first category design students from Stanford. Put your hands together for these. And, and, and what what they were able to do in sort of three days was remarkable. And what they found was that we, we gave them a particular assignment and they looked at a particular company, in this case Dropbox, and they tried to understand how well had they done category design. And so the, the, the obvious place you go to is, well, it's going to be file sharing. That's where you start, right? So and there were other people doing file sharing. But what these kids figured out was, no, they had to design a new category. Because to Chris's point, if you don't design that category, somebody else, by definition, has, which means that you are likely to be number two, three, or four, which means you're fighting over the scraps. 15 or 20 percent of the market cap of the entire category. And so by definition, the answer is if you want to be successful, yes, you do. And what happened when we were sitting in front of both uh, the ETL group at Stanford as well as the one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, classroom, there was no fear in the eyes of the students at Stanford no. about designing their own category. They just didn't know it was an option. Right. And this is what the core is. If you knew there was another thing you needed to do, to help put a place in somebody's brain to understand your value, your differentiation, why you're special, they'll do it. And these, I don't think they're kids, these you know, early stage next generation category That's designers, nice. I think Dropbox would pay millions to see what they put down on those slides about the future opportunities of a company who didn't, by the way, replace thumb drives, <laughs> but is in a highly commoditized category that is going to evaporate underneath their legs. And so I guess the only point is, it's not a, I have to do it or should I do it. If you know you can do it, you have full permission to do it. And there's a, there's a playbook and there's examples and there's a whole community of people rising up to try to help each other make this part of starting a business that is built to differentiate from the very beginning versus trying to outspend people and make more noise. And the point is, Entrepreneurs for years have thought that their product would do the talking for them, that people would get it based on the product. And if you don't educate the market, if you don't teach people to see things the way you, you did, who, who would have thought you could have created a multi-billion dollar market cap space in underwear, out of nothing? And that's what happened. And that's what every category designer does. They don't stop at product and company. 
they go out in the world and they educate the world as to why, and particularly around the problem. And when the world gets the problem, they suck the product out of that company. So let me ask you, when does this happen? Does this happen in the product conception phase where you go, oh my gosh, I've got a great idea, body shaping, whatever it is, okay, shaper. body shaper, okay, or, or frozen food, um, is do, do you envision a new category then, or is this something that gets essentially bolted on later once you go to the market? Uh, uh, it happens, today it happens the moment you have the insight. It's a basic question, right? What problem am I solving? And if I solve this problem in a pitch perfect way, what category am I in? Period. If you can answer those two questions, you're down the road in the right direction. And you'd be shocked at how hard that question is to answer. Oh, I'm sure. It all sounds easy here, but this is actually super hard to do. Hard I mean, do. this is, it all sounds easy when you tell the stories in retrospect, but when you're actually in the midst of it, it's hard. I want to let you know in a few minutes, I'm going to open this up to <laughs> questions. So get your mind thinking about the questions you want to ask these incredible panelists. Can, can, can I give you an yeah. example real quickly? I was just yeah. going to point out the, there's a couple guys down here at the end from a company called Clear Metal. They had a problem. They thought shipping logistics were broken. And I'm talking the ships that we see up and down the bay with those giant cargo ships full of goods and full of empty containers. Containers. These guys are going to fix it. There's no fear. They're taking on a 100-year-old industry and telling them they're doing it wrong. And they did it from the very beginning with explaining a problem that nobody even knew they had and giving an answer that nobody could believe existed. And that's what I mean. There's no, there is no level of effort that's not worth it. It's just committing to doing it. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm plugging you, Clear Metal, because you guys are <laughs> awesome. And and it doesn't matter how old you are, how experienced you are. You just have to make that decision. And one of my favorite examples of this meeting, we're so stoked today to have uh, Hugh Martin here from Sensity Systems, one of our favorite pirates in Silicon Valley. Where, where are you? Where is he, the pirate? There he is. There's Hugh. <laughs> so Hugh's the CEO of a company called Sensity Systems. I'll never forget our first meeting. Sensity Systems today is the leader in something called the Light Sensory Network. And here's the aha. The aha is lighting's going to LED. LED is a lot cheaper. What do you do with all that money? Well. What if we put the equivalent of an IP address and an Android phone and stuck a bunch of sensors and cameras and onto those lights and then network those lights? What could you do, right? Well, the first conversation we had with you about this, what I just said to you took about 45 minutes. And at the end of it, we're sitting there going, network lights. And I'm like, well, why are we here talking to a lighting company? Like, what horrible thing happened in my career that I'm having uh, this lighting discussion, right? <laughs> But then you have this aha, and you realize why Hugh's so excited, which is every major network has been built on the platforms of the past. So the reason we have the internet is because the government mandated the railroad roads lay pipe. And the reason we have uh, cellular phones is because the cell companies rent towers. And so what Hugh and the team realized was, wait a minute, there are lights everywhere. And there's a whole lot of you can do with those lights if they're smart and they're networked. And so when you get that insight, now here's the challenge. You have genius engineers who figure this stuff out. The challenge now is getting the world to understand that insight. And so in the case of Sensity, uh, we've talked about framing the problem. When, 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 when we first launched the new category at Sensity, their homepage had a picture of a standard light pole on it and it said, it's not their fault, they're dumb. They were just built that way. <laughs> and, and we said, if we can make the dumb pole a cigarette, we win. <laughs> That's category design and today, uh, Sensity Systems is the leader in light sensitivity networks. They have an, an investment and partnerships with both Cisco and GE, amongst many others. And they're one of the hottest companies in Silicon Valley. When you design a category, is it fixed in stone, or do categories morph over time? Well, uh, let me yeah, answer. I think part of your earlier question too, and maybe that at the same time is. Um, so one of the things we we we, we talk about in the book is that um, the category that you're you're solving or the problem that you're solving, the category you're building, has to fit the company. It can't be a suit that's too big, it can't be a suit that's too small. 
And, um, and you know, one easy example of that is, is you look back at Facebook's history. I mean, Facebook didn't start its business by saying we're going to be this global social network and, you know, do everything that they're, they're doing. You know, now. later in life, I mean, the, when Facebook looked back at its founding, it actually, the, the, uh, the leaders of Zuckerberg and Moskowitz and those guys actually looked back and they said it was actually really important to our beginning that we began in this restricted market of solving this problem of college people being able to find one another um, because it allowed them to get traction, it allowed them to, and then they, ex they expanded the, the category idea from there as they built, you know, little layer by layer outwards. So you, you can't try to take on a category, a gigantic category that you can't solve because then all you're going to do is define a category that somebody else who can solve it will come in and do it instead of you. And you can't, if you define a category that's, that's, that's you know, too minuscule for you, it's just never going to be that much of an interesting market. So, you know, the, part of the secret is actually trying to figure out what actually is the right fit. So what I hear you saying, which is actually really profound here, is that when the company starts, they might pick a relatively small category, but they're reframing it, and the frame keeps yeah. getting bigger and bigger, like Facebook, until ultimately, I mean, the, the frame that they have now could never have been one that they picked at the beginning. But did they have to have a vision of that big frame when they started? I mean, was that like building the foundation of a house? Did they need to have that frame and that vision? Well, they had to have the insight, the insight that there was, it was difficult to connect to people, and that the initial market categories, the products, markets, or the people who use them, the initial market was the university kids. Mm -hmm. And then it became applicable for a broader generation than the university kids. So what we call the category potential expands as a result of that. So the answer is, yeah. I mean, it, it, when any of these companies, Clear Metal started out with, uh, in, in this particular case, and Sensi themselves in LED lights. All of these companies started out with a very specific market, in their case, the municipalities, in these guys' case, the, uh, the container ship in companies. But the potential for what they're doing is bigger than that. And the, the whole point about category design is you have to grow that potential and articulate that potential as you go. Uh, and, and one of the things we talk about in the book is if you think about how do people value companies, for example, they will say the first question will be, and there's a lot of great VCs in this room on both sides of us here, they will, the first question they'll ask you is what is the potential for this? What's the category potential? And then they'll, the second question, because they know the 76% rule is, they'll ask you, well, what position do you have in that category? And then the third question I'll ask you is, well, how are you executing and demonstrating your capability ref relative to versions, uh, points numbers one and two above? And so as you go down the road, as you build your company and product, you also have to build your category at the same time. Is this something that established, big established companies can do, or is this only things that startups can do? Uh, no, absolutely. The big established companies can do this. Um, so a couple of quick stories. Uh, one story in the book is about Corning Glass. You know, it seems like a boring old company that's been around for 165 years. Um, what Corning has been brilliant, actually, at institutionalizing category creation. Um, and it's done this over, uh, Corning, uh, start, I mean, basically, Corning's first customer was Thomas Edison creating glass for the light bulb. Um, but over and over, it's, cre it's created the category of fiber optics. It created the category of the glass for television tubes. Um, it, it, and if you all pick up your smartphone, it's probably covered in glass that's made by Corning called Gorilla Glass, which is an entirely new category of glass that uh, Corning invented as a result of its relationship with Steve Jobs and Apple. Um, and so this is, they, they have actually created a category creation machine as part of the way that their mentality works and the way they fund research and the way they think about the market. Uh, another, another, you know, quick example of going back in history was IBM. I mean, IBM came out with the System 360 computer in 1964. IBM was 50 years old at that time. Right. It created an entirely new category of this thing called a mainframe computer that just didn't exist before. And by doing that, IBM essentially completely dominated the computer business for the next 30 years. Yep. So, you know, it's absolutely possible for large companies to do this. In the tech space, probably maybe the arguably the most exciting one of late is Amazon AWS. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And AWS comes from an insight. And the insight comes from, shit, we gotta build our data centers to scale for you know December 20, whatever the magic date is for them, right? To be able to fulfill the demand. And so that's what they build their data centers to. And it turns out that's what everybody did. 
And they have this aha that said, well, if that's what we have to do, everybody who sells stuff on the Internet has to do the same thing. Isn't it moronic that you got to build a data center to scale for one day or one week or your peak time when most of the year you don't need to do that? And then they said, well, what if we rented that capacity, right? And today you have a company that some analysts argue uh, will be worth, if you spun it out, more than Amazon itself. And I read an analyst article recently, or analyst uh, research recently, that said if you were to spin out AWS today, it would have a market cap larger than that of Oracle's. And it comes from that insight. And one business, of course, is a consumer business, and the other is an enterprise business. Unbelievable achievement. Yeah. So I'm going to ask my last question before opening it up. It's a little bit of a trick question. <laughs> so is category design, did you kind of just do this on yourself? Did you just sort of create this category design as a new category design, as category designers? <laughs> Yeah, we're doing category design right now. I mean, really? We're conditioning all your freaking minds right here. We're in a lightning strike right now. It's good stuff. No, really? I mean, yeah. The answer answer is absolutely we did, and and there's a reason for it. And and here's the reason: if you if you go talk to somebody, uh, in particular these guys, uh, but also myself, if you say, "Hey, we're marketing guys, and we do something." People automatically, because the category of marketing is already established, (laughs) immediately put you into a bucket. Uh And we were having a heck of a time trying to articulate what was different about what we did compared to an ad agency or a marketing agency. And so what did we do? We did category design on ourselves and came up with the category called category design. (laughs) Touche. Great. (laughs) Okay, so I bet this audience is filled with questions. We have runners with microphones, so all you have to do is raise your hand and they will bring the mics to you. I'm not going to call on anyone. So they have all the power. Looks like this guy's first. Hi, you know my name? Yeah. I want to give my name. My name is Peter Meyer from the Meyer Group. I created the category that you're in. My friend did 15 years ago. Welcome to the category, you guys. (laughs) (laughs) What did you call it, Peter? Category? What did you call the category that we're in? Creating and dominating new markets. Okay. Which right. is the title of the book, which you well know. <laughs> so my question We is, hope you don't think it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's your idea. <laughs> you are great at what you're doing, and I really appreciate the flattery and the compliment that you're doing. So no, I don't think it sucks. <laughs> but I have a leading question for you. When you go talk to your clients, who is the person in the characteristic of the person in your client organization who you need to talk to to make a category happen? The well, CEO. Yeah, traditionally it is the CEO because the, CEO? I'll, I'll, the reason is, is is fairly obvious. When you think about the confluence of that magic triangle, the product, the company, and the category, those things, things have to come together. And generally speaking, <laughs> as a rule, the CEO is the company that reaches across all of those three divisions. And if you look at the great category designers in history, the really great ones, just take Jobs for example, he was able to reach into the product department in a way that most of the great, the other CEOs can't. Barmer could not reach in, God bless Steve, I hope he's not in the room, but he could not reach into the product organization and actually articulate how the category and the product or the company and the product uh, connected. So we believe it's the job of the CEO to be the category designer. Having said that, we think that there is a a process-oriented person who may be in corporate development, may be in marketing as a CMO, who do embrace the process of category design and partner with the CEO. Clients and... and, um, they may never see themselves as being unicorns, but can a category king, which is in the book, you didn't mention it tonight, can a category king be a category king without being a unicorn? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We, we, tell, some, we tell some stories in the book at the end about small businesses and even individuals. Um, and so one of my favorite examples, uh, when I was a little boy, I grew up in Montreal, Canada, and my dad used to take me to this famous Jewish deli called Walensky's. It's still there today. Uh, I think Anthony Bourdain's been there, if I'm not mistaken. If you ever go to Montreal, you've got to have a Walensky special. It's a bunch of salami. And, uh, <laughs> and it's awesome. And don't ask for it without mustard or they're going to punch you in the face. And, um, and so it's this tiny little deli on, on the corner of a street. And... Mo Walensky's been dead for the better part of my life. And at noon, on 
on a uh, Wednesday afternoon in February in Montreal, cold, uh, <laughs> there's a line out the door. And so Mo in the beginning and now his family is a one location, small business, legendary bologna sandwich called Walensky's in Montreal, and it's a category they created and continue to dominate uh, three generations later. They, 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 I want to actually get you to talk a little about the, the individual career sort of oriented category design idea that we, we get to at the very end of the book. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that you would... What, no, no, yeah. I mean like... Yeah, that, okay. yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I guess, no, no, no. <laughs> I think the question <laughs> is, can I be, can I create a category for myself? Yeah, can I, I know be what a you're talking about. Can I, mean, I be a category? I'm just messing with you. Right, I'm, just, okay. I'm just messing with you. Welcome to this side of the court. <laughs> okay. journalist. All right, so, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it, it, there's a personal career decision you can make too. And it all starts with those core questions again. Now, whether you're Walensky's or your Dropbox or your uh, individual, you know, feeling stuck and wanting to do something different, it goes to the inside. When am I uniquely qualified? How do I solve problems in a unique way? And how do I take control of the position of who I am, why you should care, right? And ultimately position myself or be positioned. And that's ultimately a career decision that most people don't think they have control over. They actually think that the yearly review cycle is where you get recognized and repositioned in the company. It's nothing to do with that if you decide that you don't want to be in that world and apply category design to your personal career. Yeah, I put, love that. put up your hands, those people who have got experience design in their title, have today or have in the past. Yeah. Okay, so all of those people who put their hands up, they designed that category for themselves. They were either graphic designers, they were front-end UI right. developers, they were marketing folks who were trying to communicate a message, whatever it might be. They chose to move from that world, which someone else created, a category created a new one. There's now, like I said, 35,000 of them since 2002. Yeah, and so you can choose to be a category designer. It's a, and I, I know we're doing category design to create category design, but it's absolutely a path that is being forged and it's your decision. I don't care if you're a product marketer or a product manager or an upcoming founder or a bunch of crazy kids uh, from, uh, what was it, Tillikin? What was the horrible name of your company before you picked Clear Metal? It doesn't <laughs> matter. You can choose to do this. Tillikin? Was that what really what it was? Yeah, it was horrible. Hey, you know what? I, got, I think this is a new I book, guys. I thought it was <laughs> I think uh, that's another book. Yeah. Well, possibly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. The, so, in, the interesting thing about that, we haven't talked today about another component of category design called a point of view. Um, and you all know what a point of view is. We all, we all know uh, a company that has a point of view and a company that doesn't. So uh, have you been to Trader Joe's? Yes. Have you been to Safeway? Which company has a point of view? <laughs> Trader Joe's. That's true for people too. If you want to stand out and design your own category and you're an accountant, then you have to have a point of view about A, what problem you solve, and you have to have a unique insight around that problem, and then you have to evangelize that problem and be able to articulate how you deal with that problem in a completely unique or, and I'm going to use this word on purpose, different way. And the more value that's associated with solving that problem, the better your career is going to be. Yeah. Cool. Next question. All right. I buy a lot of the stuff, right? A uh, lot of rear view, right? Cool stuff. Tell, tell us about some examples of companies that attempted category design and failed at it. The real attempts, but didn't go anywhere. Um, and and I, think, I think you were alluding to that in the beginning, which is how, how intentional is category design in, in the company formation process? Is, it, is category actually designed by the category itself? Are the founders, how intentional does the founder need to be in, in the design of the category? Like, how, how much of it is happenstance and listening and insights, and at some point you grab on, got, on that insight and you've got the resources and momentum to actually claim that category versus actually creating? Well, well I'll start, um, and, and there might be some people in this room who throw me under the bus at the end of this conversation. Um, <laughs> but let me tell you that it is the most intentional thing you do as a CEO, having done it as a CEO as well as. 20-odd times as, a, as an exec or a consultant. And um, when 
you know, how do categories manifest? Let's just start with that concept because uh, to answer your question, Tina was talking about from a consumer point of view, you're missing something, you need to go to the supermarket to get something, what do you do? You walk in there, there's 10,000 products, how are you going to make a decision? You go look at the aisles, the aisles have the, the tags, you then start to block it all in and Toof, that's what I need. So categories are a way of people making a decision to purchase or a decision to use. It's not like it's something that's ephemeral or in the air. It's really the way brain works. Okay? So point number one is if you, if you as a CEO don't get that, you're unlikely to be one of these category kings. You have to understand that you've got to create this container that people can put you in and ultimately you'd be the first one. So that's point number one. Point number two is we were talking about it before. It's, it's not just one thing. It's not just about category design, it's in the context of the triangle. There's product design, company design, and category design that come together. And our experience is the founders, the founding team, the CEOs are generally the ones who have their ability to reach across those different groups and departments and thinking and everything else. And so they need to be that, that person who's driving that particular agenda. And then the third point is if you think about, just take enterprise software, these guys are legends uh, from Sierra, are legends in, in investing in enterprise software. And I, I bet you if you ask Tim, he would tell you that the anathema for a CEO is having a Gartner report come out and putting you in the wrong category. It sucks. Right? So there are people, just like there are at the supermarket, who design supermarkets so that when you go in and you make the right decisions and you choose a decision and hopefully going to give them to you, there are people and organizations who categorize what you do. And so if you're a CEO and you're okay with someone putting a, you in a different category, well, it's not a good idea, and Dave has a fantastic uh, story, which is, you know, you know the, uh, what's the name of that movie? Is it Hangover? It's Hangover. Hangover. Yeah. You know Mike Tyson? He's got a Mike Tyson's tattoo. You remember the dude wakes up in the morning and he's got a Mike Tyson tattoo on his face? Well, good, I hope you like a Mike Tyson's tattoo if that's who you are as a CEO. You've got to be the one that controls that agenda, that conversation you have with the Gartner analyst or the Forrester analyst or any of the other hundred industry analysts out there or the influential people in the world who are going to convince all of the other people who are the buyers but beneath them, the followers, if you like. If you're not teaching and you're not driving that agenda, somebody else is. And, and, and we are here tonight because we believe that the vast majority of people in the technology industry don't know what Al just said. And I'm going to... Thank you. <laughs> One other person. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, man. I get a hell of a... But I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a very specific example, and it costs billions of dollars. Uh, if you read any interview with the Google founders, one of the most legendary companies in Silicon Valley history, as you well know, the net-net of what they say when they get asked the question, why is Google Google, is it was the algorithm. <laughs> That's what they say. My carbodingulator was better than their carbodingulator, and we kicked Yahoo and Excite and At Home and pfft, all those guys' asses, right? That's what they would tell you. So they become a category king. They take, in their case, more than 76% of the economics. So one of the greatest category kings in the history of our industry doesn't know why they're a category king. And here's the proof. Bing. The guy that ran the Bing project after he left Google wrote a blog post, a very famous one, you might have seen it, and that blog post said, we f***ed up. And he talks about why. And the net of the article was, what we learned is, the world didn't want another Facebook. And so even... Talking about Google Plus, right? Google Plus, yes. <laughs> so they attack Facebook with Google Plus. How many people here on Google Plus? <laughs> yeah. Google Plus should merge with the Microsoft Store. <laughs> and Bing. And they would Bing. have emptiness at scale. <laughs> but so Google doesn't understand the compounding power of a category king. Google doesn't understand that you can't beat somebody whose category design, product design, and company design were accepted as the standard for the market by which all others will be judged, and that you could show up with Google+, Plus, which I would argue is a better product, and no one cares. Question. Does it cost a lot of money to do this? Is this something that you can do on a shoestring, or does it cost a lot of money to be the de facto, you know, to create a category? I mean, let's say I create a new condiment, okay, and I want there to be another label on that aisle. How much does that cost me to have that happen? Well, here's the, let me give you the alternative. So you're gonna, you're gonna spend all this time building what you think is a legendary carbodingulator and the company to go take yeah. it to market. 
and you're going to launch it into someone else's category. <laughs> you're done. But at, at, be, at best, yeah, you're playing for 25% of the market cap. That's what the big data science says, at best and you're playing by somebody else's rules. So if you believe in the quality of your product innovation, then you better believe that you need to do market education because the bigger the innovation, the more the education. Category design is fundamentally about getting the market to come to you. We all have companies that have go-to-market strategies. Well, going to market's important, but you know what? We think it's a lot better to get the market to come to you. And the short answer, yeah, it's not money. It's not. Uh, there's examples in this room. Uh, Hugh and the team launched Light Sensory Network with one marketing manager. And now... One legend. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Clear metal, folks. It's, the cost isn't money. The cost is commitment and time and focus. And vision. And you have to trade yeah. off. And belief that there's a process. Yeah. And the courage of your own convictions. Yeah. It takes a lot of... Uh, I'll say guts to stand in front of a zero billion dollar market and say we're going to create a legendary company and there's no market for it. Nobody like likes to human. nobody likes to stand on the mountain by themselves. This well, me, whole me... technology industry is built around trying to outbetter somebody else. You know, that's, if you work in the enterprise space, there's a list of features on one side, there's a list of features on the other, and everybody wants to go par, and they say their product's better, and so that comes at a higher cost on the product. Uh, yeah. part of the company than any decision you're going to make around positioning yourself as a category leader. So uh, it's not a money thing and it's not a, even a resource or number of people thing. It's just a pure commitment to understand how this fits in with all the things you're really spending a lot of money on, which is company and product. That's where all the cash is going. I, I thought I'd maybe tell a brief yeah. story from this, this here in this room. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the things that was interesting to us is once we sort of defined this sort of the, you know, category design and category creation and all of this, it, it gave us what we often said was a lens that allowed us to sort of point this lens at different things that were going on in the industry, past, present, future, whatever, and, and have a bit of a different way of like looking at what, you know, what, what happened. So um, there's a, over, oh Jeff, you're looking at some, your phone or something over there, but over here in the corner is Jeff Hawkins. Um, who you know uh, created the Palm Pilot and basically gave us the idea of mobile devices. Now I would like to actually bring Jeff up here if I could. I'm not doing this, Jeff, to talk to and ask him. But I'm going to I'm going to tell Jeff's story in a little bit different way, maybe, and than he would. He'd probably tell me I'm wrong. But um, uh, when um, when Jeff was Jeff was sort of in the middle of of this moment in time when when people were doing these like Casio zoomers and kinds of things and everybody was thinking that the, that they these handheld devices had to be a standalone thing that they had to do everything within this device and the and the, the technology wasn't there to make them work very well and so people kind of like knew they wanted something like this but um, but the devices just never really worked very well so they weren't really taking off um, and. I would say, you know, for using our lens to look at what Jeff did back in, in those days, and he was out of, if I remember right, out of money, out of time, <laughs> basically like in a desperation mode of trying to figure out what to do with this company that you'd started and, and had, had been had funded. Um, and uh, and his, his, his great insight was um, that these devices are not, stand, don't have to be standalone devices, they are accessories to your computer. So if you think of those first prompts, what they did, you know, the magic thing that they did was they actually synced with your computer. So this was a way for him to make these devices workable and useful and not have to put all of the power in there and, and make it a companion to your computer. And, and, and all of a sudden, we all got the idea of a mobile device that we could carry around and have some of the data about our lives in there. And, and suddenly, this, this whole entire market went, aha, I get it. It works, and Jeff, you know, turned everybody's heads around. Um, and so he did this, and in complete no money desperation, you know, uh, mode, and, and you know, and and it was just it was just a, an insight that he understood that he had to do something that was different that actually made this work. So, was that? All right, pretty good. I did a pretty good job. All right, good. So anyway, that's you know I, just because he was he was here, and we tell the story in the book, by the way, actually, and and so it's a, a great example of something you know a moment in history, uh, you know a, a, a huge category creation moment in history that happened with you know basically one guy um, you know really trying to work it out by himself. Okay, next question. I don't see it. 
see what Hi there. So, Hi. My name is Tim Nardell. I know all these guys. <laughs> my question is, how do you address the luck factor in creation of a category? Candidate? It's better to have it than not. Why not MySpace? Why was it Facebook? Okay, so that, that, that was not luck in okay. that particular case specifically. That was not luck. That was different. MySpace was you made up your handle and you made up a fictitious uh, persona. Facebook was not that. It was me and that's who you were meeting. So there were very different approaches to what we now know as a social network. Um, timing is another way of saying luck, and uh, I can tell but, you there's a bunch of people over here <laughs> who have lived through the timing exercise with me on a couple of occasions. Timing is vital. And the, the, the reason it is, is not just about category per se, but uh, and the, the, the uh, Palm Pilot example is a great example of that. There wasn't a network that existed back then that enabled devices to talk to things without wires and all that sort of stuff. And so if you were trying to invent what Jeff was trying to invent back then without that infrastructure, it was probably tough. So timing and where technology is at particular points of time is absolutely vital in any of these businesses. And like I said, it's better to have timing on your side than not. Um, we, one of the stories we tell in the book, and of course Chris and Dave lived through this in the case of the CRM space. Um, for those of you who don't know, and there's actually some pictures in the program that we've given you here, which talk about the category lifecycle and some of the other data science we did. One of them is a story of the, category, of the CRM and how that evolved. And it started out as contact managers, filofaxes. Who had filofaxes back in the day? Put your hands up, come on. Okay. <laughs> So it was 1920 when those things started, just so you know. So for the kids in the room who will not believe this story, but it used to be that if I met you somewhere, I would write details down on a filofax and put them in a filing cabinet, which was, which was circular. And that then, when PCs came, that then emerged to be contact managers. Remember the ACT software? Oh! Oh, excuse me. <laughs> He's having flashbacks. That moved to Salesforce uh, automation. Then finally, we saw CRM emerge sort of in the... In the, in, the, in the early 90s. Uh, and that was where Siebel came to power. Well, the thing that Siebel kind of missed was that this move from what is now called on-premise software to the cloud happened, and they missed that technology uh, um, change. And so they timed the release of, if you like, the product. Even though they were the category king of CRM, they had 95% of the market share. You couldn't install it because all of the Anderson and everyone else consultants were already signed up doing it for someone else. Along comes Benioff and says, actually, the problem is you can never get that thing installed. It doesn't work, and it's too expensive. I can do this in the cloud. The product was one-tenth the capability of what the Siebel Systems was, but because it could be deployed easily, quickly, and one instance of it, i.e., one piece of software, it could be distributed universally. Boom. So you could argue Siebel had bad luck. You could argue some other things. The truth is, they just missed the timing. But th there's a really important thing to get here. There are some, if you will, realities about that. The cloud was emerging, blah, blah, blah. But in a lot of ways, category design is about making the timing happen. Brian Roberts, the legendary healthcare tech investor, says when it works, things go from non consensus to consensus fast. If you think about the cloud and the story Al just told, Benioff has been preaching for the better part of 20 years, no software. No software is a way of framing a problem. If you go back to 1999, everybody almost said, you're not going to be able to get CIOs to put their data in somebody else's data center, and what do you mean I don't own the app? And like, There was a billion reasons why this was never going to happen, right? And it did. And the reason it did, for the most part, was A, there were some technology forces at play. You can't do Uber without a smartphone. Absolutely. However, one guy screamed no software for 20 years and single-handedly made the cloud happen and he conditioned the market to think about computing the way he wanted us to and we all stopped buying software and now we don't have our data and we rent software and that's all just fine. <laughs> wow. Great. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Okay, yeah, who's there's what? Uh, how do you see lean startup failing fast, pivoting and category design related if at all? 
Yeah, so uh, actually Mike uh, could answer this question a lot better. He just wrote a great paper on it. <laughs> read Mike's blog on it. But let, let me paraphrase, which is, um, here's the problem. Lean startups gave us a way of, on limited budgets and short periods of time, creating answers to problems really quickly. The good news was you got lots of answers. The bad news was there's lots of answers. Couple that with the fact that today we get thousands of marketing messages a day up two or three times from a decade ago. And couple one more thing on top of that, which is these aren't just dumb marketing messages coming at you from a TV program. These are marketing messages that come out the back end of a pretty sophisticated marketing engine that knows who you are, what you like, where you live, who you talk to, and every other freaking thing. So in addition to the fact you're getting two or three times the volume, the signal to noise ratio is way off the charts higher. So think about this. Here's the problem. You're looking at literally dozens, potentially hundreds of solutions at any point in time. The messages that you're getting are more targeted, and there's more of them. And so we talk about in the book this notion of brain science. How does the brain process in, 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 in that state? When it's in that overwhelmed state, which it is, what does it do? And there's some wonderful work by uh, Daniel Kahneman and a number of other people who are experts in this area. And here's what we figured out. There are four sort of biases that matter when you're processing this stuff. The brain starts to go on instinct, not on logic. You can't look at 100 different solutions and say, well, 99 is better than 98, but 97 has got this and 95 has got that. That's not what happens. First of all, someone anchors the conversation. It's called the anchoring effect. This is the problem. This is how you should solve it. Benioff, to Chris's point, did that brilliantly. And there's many other examples of that. The second thing is there's this whole notion of sort of social conditioning, where if Tim, who I trust, likes that solution, my brain just normally goes, well, if Tim likes it, I'm just going to get it. And in a social environment, that's unbelievable. And there's a number of other biases that play out. And so in some ways, lean startups helped us. But I think we're going to see a trend away from that, honestly. I think we are going to go back to a much more um, insight and vision-driven uh, perspective that's going to happen. And people are going to really consider how they do condition the market to, as Christopher says, come to them as opposed to blast these noises out there. Uh, and so an anecdotal that, story on, on this one. Uh, we were uh, in a meeting just last week. And it was with a really um, uh, talented crew. They do uh, advertising, a little bit of branding, a lot of production. About fell out of my chair. Said, we said, hey, well, wh where's the new channel coming from? What's going on? And he said three things. More companies than ever, more noise than ever. We're finding television advertising to be the lowest cost way to deliver a high fidelity message. <laughs> if you wait long enough. Are you enough. kidding me? <laughs> Television advertising? Why? They, they had Ogilvy out. They said, because there's too much noise and we have to create a point of view. We didn't say anything. We just sat there and bit our tongues in half and, and uh, nodded. But there is something happening that requires you to use a different technique to get through the noise because you can't outspend people. They'll just keep raising money, billions of dollars, billions of dollars to outpace you, outgrow you, and outspend you, and make more noise than you. So that's how that whole thing fits into your question. And, yeah. and, and, and just to put a fine point of it, you know, what, what, what Steve and Eric did was genius work. And, and, you know, Mike way back when said 500 grand is a new 5 million. And so the fact that we can we have been able to, with the plummeting cost of startup uh, innovation, be able to do company and product design much faster, much cheaper, is awesome. The, here's the one problem, is, and it's got nothing to do with the work of, of Eric and, and Steve. People don't buy solutions unless they have problems. And every technology entrepreneur we've ever met screams, look how awesome my solution is. And so what Lean Startup's done, to Al and Dave's point, is accelerate the speed with which you can create new products and companies. The degree to which those entrepreneurs scream, look how awesome my product and company is, is the degree to which the whole world goes, no, 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 don't give it. There's two million apps on my iPhone, no, no, no. And so the product and company has to live in a relatable place. When we walk into the grocery store, we say, hey, we need milk. That's a category. So we go to where the milk is. Somebody needs to say, I'm interested in file sharing before I start talking about Ignite versus Dropbox versus Box. 
right? Cloud file sharing needs to be a thing I understand and think is important and strategic that solves a problem. And if it's not, you can scream box and Ignite and Dropbox and Flopbox and whatever, and no one cares. And that's the point. No, no, I, I, I think most founders that we meet at least have a vision. They have a founding insight. They know there's a problem. Lean Startup traditionally has allowed them to get to solving pieces of that problem quickly and in a repeatable manner with customer feedback and all of the other verification systems you need. So it, it, to Chris's point, it's wonderful. It, no one's saying that it's going away at all and Agile is a thing that we're all going to be doing for a long period of time. No question. Having said that, what Chris just said is really important, which is unless you articulate the problem, unless you are able to create a container in somebody's mind, all you're going to hear is, to my point before about the number of messages, you're just going to hear 50 of these things. Lean Startup doesn't help you a bit. Here's one of our simple examples. We're surfers. The creator of the surfing wetsuit, his name is Jack O'Neill. He lives here in Santa Cruz. And... If you buy a Jack O'Neill wetsuit, there's a tag on it with his picture, and he's got the pirate mask on because he's got the f***er by and everything. And, and there's a quote from Jack, and it says, I'm just a surfer who wanted to surf longer. What it doesn't say is, I'm a surfer who wanted to create, let me tell you about all these features. <laughs> right? So before Jack, you know what they surfed in? Board shorts and wool sweaters. Anybody here been in the Northern California water? <laughs> not so much. You can surf for three hours and come out of the water and not be cold today. I'm just a surfer who wanted to surf longer, frames a problem every surfer who's ever wanted to surf here understands. Let me, now I'm interested in all the carbodingulation features of the techno butter and the rah, that they want to say, which is all the same carbodingulation we say in the tech business. So I love this because it also resonates with a lot of things that we teach is that you should fall in love with the problem, not the solution. And you guys have just showed us how to do that. Can we have a huge round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so very much for sharing your extremely candid points of view with us. <laughs> I hope that everybody in the room walks away with fresh inspiration, new questions, and new exploration. As a very small token of our appreciation, we have for you tonight the Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Yes! <laughs> Lovely. Please wear that in very good health. A recording of this program will be available on the Churchill Club YouTube channel where you will find recordings of most of our other programs as well. We hope that you find that to be a useful resource. Our next program is next week called Blockchain in the Open at the Computer History Museum on June 30. We hope to see you there. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you.